Excellent. Okay, so now you can go ahead. Okay, good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session on coastal oceanography and inland waters. And uh, I'll be uh, going to chair uh, this session. I'm Shiliang Shan from Royal Military College of Canada. And in this session, as you can see from the agenda, we have three speakers. The first three speaker is going to focus on the west coast of Canada. And then we will have a speakers to talk about uh, uh, inland waters in, uh, in Northern Canada, James Bay. So, uh, Gochi, are you, are you ready for the for sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, yes. I see. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see. Uh, so our oh, first speaker okay. is Gochi Han, and he's a senior research scientist uh, from DFO, and he's going to talk about the seasonal and the interannual variations uh, in the shelf circulation of West Coast of Canada. Gochi, over to you. Okay, thanks, Sri. So yeah, I'm going to talk about seasonal and interannual variations of uh, shelf circulation uh, of the west coast of Canada. So my co-author is uh, Nicola Lambert, and there are many other people, you know, to be acknowledged for their contribution during the setup of the model and uh, the discussion. So in particular, this project is. Uh, uh, supported by Surface Water and Ocean Topography Canada and uh, managed by Canadian Space Agency and uh, DFO's uh, Competitive Science Research uh, Funding. Okay, so in the Northeast Pacific, uh, the North Pacific Current uh, flows eastward in at mid-latitudes, and it separates uh, into two branches. One is equatorward, uh, called the California Current, and the other is uh, poleward, called the Alaska Current. And over the shelf break and uh, continental slope, uh, the surface flow uh, in winter time, it goes uh, pole world, and in summertime it goes uh, uh, equator world, and underneath there's a, a pole world flowing uh, California undercurrent year round. So this is the, basically what we know, like the largest scale ocean circulation feature uh, in this region, and DFO uh, have put, has uh, deployed many you know, current meter moorings, uh, but they are usually short duration, okay? And uh, there is, however, you know, one long-term monitoring site, as indicated by triangle here, located over the shelf break of West Vancouver Island, and the data are from 1985 to present. And recently, satellite altimetry has been used to provide complementary and near real time information for shelf edge currents. Uh, so has been you know, incorporated into the uh, state of the ocean reporting. Uh, on the numerical modeling side, uh, there have been many interesting and excellent studies. So to name a few here, just to give some you know, ideas. And uh, Maison and Cummins uh, use the numerical model to study generation of the Vancouver Island coastal current. And De Lorenzo et al. Uh, investigated the formation of the uh, Haida 80s. And uh, Foreman et al. studied the generation of cyclonic uh, wonderful Ka 80. And uh, Herman et al. Investi investigated the role of local and remote forcing during 1997-98 Ioninio event. And also seasonal and interannual variabilities in this region uh, have been studied by Maison and Fan. 
uh, suitings at all develop the uh, bioclinical circulation model. So it's also the uh, Salish C cast operated by Susan the group at uh, UBC uh, for the Strait of Georgia and the uh, one of Castrate. So in DA4, there are other models, the British Columbia Continental Matching Model and the uh, Northeast Pacific uh, 136, 136 degree and the canoe uh, model. Um, so these models have studied you know, climatic variability and change mainly focused on biological uh, environment, bio, biogeochemical environments also involve physics. Uh, recently, Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, as we know, has developed an operational uh, bioclinic circulation model, CIOPS West, uh, mainly for short-term uh, forecasting. So lots of modeling uh, work going on. And so this research uh, is motivated by uh, two projects. One is uh, supported by you know, SWAT uh, C, that's the surface water and ocean topography Canada satellite program to understand uh, mesoscale and the sub mesoscale dynamics in the coastal, uh, in the oceans. And in the earlier session, you know, Mass, uh, Pascal Matt talked about potential application of the SWAT in the river uh, and estuarine uh, waters. So it's also uh, motivated by the CSIF project in DFO to improve extreme sea levels uh, I have presented earlier this morning. So within these two projects, we have developed this 136 degree Northeast Pacific Ocean model. Uh, we have now obtained uh, sea level and the circulation hindercasts uh, for a period over 1993 and 2000. 21. So with the collaboration with the Will Perry and other people, we're also working on a Northeast uh, Pacific Ocean wave modeling system, knee palms. And that will require probably a longer time frame within one or two years, where we'll provide uh, reporting the other progress in, in, in the including the wave ocean coupling. So in this talk, the focus is using uh, the Nippon handcasts over 1993 uh, to 2021 to understand the seasonal and interannual variations of major shear scale ocean currents uh, off the west coast of Canada. So some model details, uh, it's Nemo, a 3.6, uh, 136 degree in the horizontal and 75 layers in the vertical. So same configuration as CIOPS West. Uh, for the open boundary condition, uh, for the open boundary, we specify non-tidal sea surface height. Uh, it's daily gross 112 degree output uh, plus our inverse parametric effect. And we also specify daily glorious 112 degree output for temperature salinity and the velocities. So for tides, we apply uh, eight semi-diurnal and diurnal constituents from wave tide. Uh, climatological monthly means of a river runoff of Morrison at all uh, uh, specify. So atmospheric forcing is EIA5 hourly products. So here's some model uh, evaluation. So we are looking at a comparison between model and observation uh, at a long-term monitoring site. That's A1 here, okay, off West Vancouver Island. And here we are comparing uh, monthly temperature at uh, three depths, 35 meter, 100 meter, and 175 meter. So the dotted lines are observations and the dots are observations and the solid line is model result. And so 
by looking at the comparison, you can see model is able to well capture this uh, seasonal and interannual variations. And, uh, but we do see some bias at uh, subsurface at 100 meter and 175 meter. So it's about a two point, a point to five Celsius degree Celsius and 0.5 degree Celsius uh, overestimation and which to me, you know, is quite a reasonable uh, scale. Uh, in, and if you look at the correlation, so as you can see, uh, it's a surface correlation is a kind of good and uh, for the subsurface is a much better. And we also calculate this uh, variance ratio, okay? So a variance ratio is the variance uh, between the model and observation difference, uh, variance of the model observation difference to the variance of the observation, okay? So if it's zero means a perfect fit and the smaller, the better. Usually we want them to be at least below one, you know? And so as you can see now the value is uh, uh, from 0.33 to 0.68, and we consider this is a very good comparison, okay, quantitatively. And we also look at the salinity. And uh, so again, observation is dots and uh, model is curve. And uh, if you look at the visually, you know, uh, you see overall reasonable agreement, but you do see some bias, okay? And for the salinity now, the model tends to um, be fresher. So it's underestimation of the salinity. Again, the value of under, underestimation is not that uh, large. I think it's between 0.2 to 0.5. So I would say that's where, I, acceptable. And if you look at correlation, it's a good, fair to good correlation. And uh, the variance ratio, you can see for the sub, for 100 meter is very good. And, but for the surface and for the bottom, you know, the value is large, but we got to see where this large comes from. So the most, uh, the problem uh, for the model is overestimating this variability to some degree. But because of the actual observed variability is quite small. So when you divide it you know, by the small observed variance, this gamma squared will, is, uh, in, uh, will be large. You know? And so if you look overall you know, quantitatively, it's not that it's you know, a good uh, agreement. Certainly there are room, uh, rooms to you know, improve the results uh, in the future. So now we look at the uh, currents and also at three uh, le levels, 35 meter, 100 meter and 175 meter. And this is the eastward uh, component. So you can see visually it's very good uh, agreement in capturing seasonal and interannual availability uh, by the model. And the correlation also in um, good to strong, okay? And if you look at the northward component, the, basically it's similar. So it's a quite a good uh, agreement visually or in terms of uh, correlation value. Uh, if you look at the variance ratio, so it's combined by uh, U and V now combined together. So that will not represent magnitude, but also representing uh, the, any agreement or discrepancy in direction, okay? And so the gamma squared is around 0.7. And uh, based on what, you know, models we have been using and the comparison and the literature values, we uh, look at that, this kind of number indicate a you know, good model scale in terms of, cap terms of capturing the variability in currents. 
So this slide shows the climatological uh, mean circulation um, at 30 to 100 meter uh, in January on the left and in July on the right to represent winter and the summer respectively. So you can see over the shear of age, uh, this dominant uh, forward flow in winter and thus inflow through the mouth of Queen Charlotte Sound, okay, into the Queen Charlotte Sound and the Hector Strait and go through the Dixon entrance, then drawing the, into the Northeast Pacific again. Uh, for this July, then you will see the reverse of the shear of age current. Okay, now it's forward. And you can also see the flow in Hector Strait and uh, Queen Charlotte Sound is mainly going to be go through the uh, Queen Charlotte Sound mouth to exit to North East Pacific. And uh, also there's a more like a 80 like structures or some dry, semi gyres due to topographic, you know, stealing controlling constraint. And if you look at the shift, we can see this, uh, uh, toward the floor uh, remains, okay? Uh, so mainly due to the uh, fresh water input contribution, you know, the wind effect cannot completely uh, reverse the circulation over the shear. So we also look at the vertical structure in more detail uh, at uh, long-term monitoring station, A1 here. And the top panel is uh, uh, from model and the lower panel is from observation. And uh, so uh, blue means equator word and the pink means uh, whole word. So you can see on the top layer from both model and ADCP observation shows in summer is going uh, equator world and in winter time uh, going forward here, forward. But for the subsurface where the California current uh, is located, so you can see the development of uh, uh, undercurrent from spring then as intensifies through summer and reach the peak in fall time and then gradually uh, weakening again in following winter, okay, in the winter. So there's a good consistency. And then now we have chosen uh, several transects to look at the detailed uh, distribution of the transport. So first we look at this uh, uh, T2 transect of the West uh, Vancouver Island and uh, it's uh, January versus July. And if it's uh, uh, yellow, greenish means uh, uh, poleward and the blue means equatorward. So you can see in the winter time, uh, it's predominantly uh, poleward. And in the summer time, you will see uh, over the shear for this uh, uh, poleward flow. And uh, over the slope, you see um, equator with the flow near the surface and at the middle depth, it's the poleward uh, flow, okay? And we do also see some counter current, you know, uh, off the west coast of Vancouver Island, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, equator. So this shows that ship mounted ADCP results and uh, you can see this structure is quite similar. The model structure is quite similar versus ADCP observation in some way. But we do locate, notice that the uh, location, you know, and observation also is uh, in like offshore of A1. Like A1 is at the 500 meter depth. It's at around this location, but the core of under, uh, undercurrent will be 10 to 20, 15 kilometers offshore of the A1. So here we are looking at the uh, velocity distribution at the T3, that's the Queen Charlotte Sound mouth 
uh, transact. And uh, so uh, yellow is uh, inflow and blue is outflow. So we can see winter broad inflow uh, to uh, Queen Charlotte Sound on the east and the narrow outflow on the west. In July, there's there are more complicated outflow inflow pattern. Uh, so at the Dixon entrance, that's uh, a T6 transect. And uh, this yellowish flow means uh, uh, it's a uh, outflow. Uh, and uh, blue is inflow. So we can see in winter time, uh, uh, it's a dominant uh, outflow on the north and a dominant uh, inflow on the south, whether it's winter or summer, but just the winter is uh, stronger. And we also see this counterflow on the northern side, okay. So we further calculated uh, the volume transport uh, here you, at uh, these three transects, okay? And here you are looking at uh, coastal current, um, T2E, uh, T3E, and T6N. So basically it's this coastal current uh, pattern, okay? So the top panel is for uh, transport from, the, um, from Vancouver Island coastal current to transport is uh, poor water year round and stronger in winter, uh, fall and weaker in spring and summer. And for the Queen Charlotte Sound mouth, so the net flow as indicated by dashed line, it's uh, inflow year round. But when you look at the Eastern side, blue and the Western side by uh, yellow, you can see the strong seasonal variation and uh, it's dominant inflow on the East and uh, dominant outflow on the west. So for the uh, Dickinson entrance transect, uh, you can see net outflow as indicated by a red dashed line. And for the northern and the southern side, so northern is always uh, outflow and uh, uh, Southern is always uh, uh, inflow. Okay. So we also look at the seasonal variation of the transport uh, through T2W and T5E. So that basically is the current over the shear age and the continental slope. And we look at upper and lower. So upper is in uh, blue and the lower is in, in red. So for the upper, you can see this seasonal cycle and the winter fall is uh, poleward and the summer spring is uh, equatorward. And if you look at the California undercurrent, that's the lower layer. So it's uh, almost like poleward year round and uh, stronger in, in, in fall. And here the top panel is from southern boundary. So we call it the TSB, just to give you an idea. As you can see, you know, they are very, the signal cycle is very close uh, between the southern boundary of the model and at this T2W and T5W. And so we also look at the uh, interannual variations. Here we are looking at uh, uh, transport for coastal currents at three transects. And uh, so the blue here is the transport and the red here is the wind anomaly, longshore wind anomalies at a buoy of uh, West Vancouver Island. And here just showing the transport anomalies, same transport anomalies, but the uh, Nino 3.4 index, okay. So basically it's a busy, you know, uh, plot uh, slide, but basically uh, the transport anomaly positively correlated with the longshore wind anomalies of uh, West Vancouver Island at all three transects, and it also positively correlated with Nino 3.4 index and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index, uh, but not correlated with uh, uh, Nino 3.4 
for index or PDO index at Queen Charlotte Sound transect, okay? And at the Dixon entrance, and transport anomalies are po positively correlated with a Pacific decadal oscillation, but not with a Nino 3.4 index. So if we look at the shear of age currents, and uh, we, the slide again is busy, but if you carefully look at this and calculate the correlation, so we found the upper layer shear of age current positively correlated with longshore wind anomalies of West Vancouver Island, uh, positively correlated with the southern boundary flow, that's the top panel, okay? And a positively correlated with uh, uh, Nino 3.4 for index to a lesser degree with uh, uh, Pacific decadal oscillation. So for the undercurrent, uh, that's showing by, by blue and as by, by green. Um, so it's positively correlated with the southern boundary flow and positively correlated with uh, Nino 3.4 index, but to a lesser degree with the Pacific decadal oscillation. So basically I've showed this transport and also just kind of a correlation. So after some kind of, you know, think, thinking and reading literature and found this flow patterns of coastal currents and GFAG currents at the top and at the middle depths seems, you know, very much related to this dominant wind pattern here. So as you can see, uh, it, on the left is uh, January, it's a predominant of West Vancouver Island, it's the downwelling favorable winds. And in the summertime, it's uh, upperwelling favorable winds. And we also see in summertime, especially you see strong difference of these longshore winds from, you know, uh, off Canadian coast and off the Oregon, uh, Washington, Oregon, Oregon coast. So this, uh, you know, switch of the wind patterns and also the spatial variation of longshore winds and are very important actually for generating this transport. And together with the you know, remote wind forcing and uh, of the US coast. And I would say uh, the impact of uh, Pacific decadal oscillation and uh, ENSO would it be to largely you know, uh, manifested through this regional uh, wind patterns. And, uh, and uh, of course there may be you know, atmospheric teleconnection. Uh, so, so for the Vancouver Island coastal current and the Northern BC coastal current, of course the freshwater input from rivers are very important in regulating this seasonal cycle. But in our model, so we didn't uh, uh, include any interannual variation of freshwater runoffs. So I think the interannual variabilities are mainly uh, from the wind changes and not from wind changes. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's what I would like to say. Thank you all. Thank you, Bodhi. That's uh, uh, right on time and uh, very comprehensive. Uh, analysis and comparison. And uh, now, uh, do you have any questions? I saw Jingyu has his hand up. Jingyu? Yeah, uh, really nice talk. So, which I just want to know the data you, uh, the model, the model, uh, you need to put a model for like, I don't know, 17, 20 years, isn't it? 17 years. Yes. It, it, is any data um, simulation or is this a pure pronostic model run? This is a pure pronounced model run. There's no so, data simulation. I see. So it's actually easy to do the comparison between the simulated and observed the temperature, so they need in the current are really, really excellent. You know what I mean? So for the pure pronounced run. That's right. Yeah. Probably one thing I would say, I would really attribute it to the, you know, at least it's one important factor is the Glorious 112's model output. Because it's oh. the data assimilative model. And as yes. you can see, the boundary input is very important. It seems that internal, you know, especially shear of shear, shear of edge current is so well correlated with the boundary inflow. Oh. And as we know from dynamics, like the on the seasonal probably and also interannual scales, it's much 
of the transport of circular is forced by the upstream, you know, and yes. yeah. Uh, so yeah. so yeah. So, so the I boundary condition, yeah. so the realistic boundary condition is, is one of the reason for the greater success of the regional model. That's right. So, okay. And Excellent. we also noticed actually for the offshore part, yes, the model. I, th I think as also, I mean, if I remember correctly, uh, by the ECCC, you know, in the Seattle uh, East. Offshore part, you know, in the deep ocean, I think another 136 degree model tended to generate more energetic, like more it is generated it is. than probably altimetry, at least by comparing with altimetry, you know, it's more yes. uh, vigorous in, in, the, yeah. in the model, but we haven't yeah. compared that part, you know, uh, in this model. It's <clears throat> mostly focused on shear circulation. Right. Yeah, I saw this as a, Rome have a tendency to generate a lot of eddies, but uh, but uh, but I will be find out that uh, this is the area are realistic or not. Yeah. Okay. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Good. We got uh, one last question from Andy. Hi, uh, yeah, got you. Very good uh, talk. I'm just curious. Uh, when you do the T three section, is there any um, flow like a recirculation back to T two? Uh, like if you could, uh, I mean. It's possible to or not to deduct uh, the the circulation through the like a like Johnston Strait and just just the, the circulation or the uh, net transport along the Vancouver Island. Maybe you, uh, there would be an improvement for the correlation or, or not, like seasonal variation. Uh, have you considered that? Or? So yeah, talking about that. T three. Yeah, yeah. yeah, talking about Johnston Strait here, right? Yeah, if, if any recirculation go back to T2, I mean, if you deduct that part, uh, maybe the T3 can give you more, um, I, I don't know, like a, like a net uh, flow. Uh, deduct the T back to T2, how? Do... Is there any uh, net circulation around, around the Vancouver Island? Oh, net circulation, I think there's a transport that goes through the Johnson yeah. Johnston Street. I think it's Johnston Street, right? And it's yeah. very small amount. You know, we did the calculate, but I didn't use that. Well, I could look at this to see if there's actually circling around this island. Yes. How, what's <laughs> yeah, amount. Maybe minor, But I yeah. know from what I look at, I think this portion, the circulation is quite complicated, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, very yeah. dynamic how they change and the recirculation, small eddies and these things. Yeah. After after the uh, this the P area but after this penetra, you know, and they are very complicated, especially in summertime. Yeah. Yeah. And, Certainly and I, we'll I, look at, you know, more details uh, for, for the uh, coastal area, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Goji, for the great presentation. Now thank let's you. move on to uh, next speaker. The next or next speaker is Amber Holtworth. And she's going to talk about the extremes along the continental margin, uh, also in the West Coast. Amber, the floor is yours. Okay, great, thanks. Um, super lucky to get to follow Gochi, who's already explained the oceanography of the region and talked about uh, model. Uh, similar configuration anyway. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors here, uh, Andrew Shaw from HPE and uh, Jim Christian uh, from uh, also from DFO, but also from the Canadian Center for Climate Modeling and Analysis. And I represent Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And so I'm going to tell you about our work um, exploring extremes uh, in marine conditions of temperature acidification and deoxygenation. And by deoxygenation here, I'm really talking about the long-term decline in oxygen in the ocean due to global warming and not eutrophication. And so one of the things that really motivates this kind of work is the impacts that these extremes can have on marine biota. So when these extremes occur concurrently or consecutively, they can have cumulative impacts that greatly exceed the effects of a single stressor in isolation. And so I grabbed a figure here from Portner's uh, 2010 paper, and he's showing the rate of aerobic performance versus temperature. And you can see that aerobic performance increases to a peak and then drops off rather uh, quickly. The effect of a hypoxia is to lower that peak and of acidification is to narrow that um, curve. 
And so we're really interested in understanding what drives the changes, changes in these stressors and where and when they've occurred in the recent past, as well as what the impacts of these extremes are for marine organisms. And so to do this, we're using the Northeastern Pacific Canadian Ocean Ecosystem Model, NEP36 CANOE. The CANOE is just for pronunciation. Um, this is an ocean model developed under NEMO version 3.6. It has biogeochemistry, which is the Canadian Ocean Ecosystem Model, um, originally developed for the Canadian Ocean System Model by Jim Christian and others. We have tides, we have a grid spacing of 136 uh, degree Latin law and 75 vertical levels, and you can see the domain with its uh, resolution there. The Hindcast I ran is from 1997 to 2019. I used ARI5 for the atmosphere. I imposed atmospheric CO2 um, using the Mauna Loa trend plus mid-latitude annual cycle. I used Glorus 12 version one at the open boundaries and glued up for our BGC. We have tides um, from FES uh, 2014. Uh, we used tidal loading and attraction in this case. I have five day average outputs and I also have high frequency outputs. So three hourly outputs, but only for just this subset region. So where you can see the bathymetry here, I have three hourly outputs for temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrate, DIC and total alkalinity. Um, so one of the real motivating factors for this work comes from previous work that we did with the same model. We did some climate impacts research where we looked at a historical period from 1986 to 2005 and a future period uh, from 2046 to 2065 under two different climate scenarios. And so here I'm showing, um, if you look on the, the right-hand side there, I've got a slice that I've taken off of West Coast Vancouver Island and I'm showing summer climatologies for the historical on the left column and for RCP 4.5, which is a moderate mitigation emission scenario on the right hand side. And so as we go down the different uh, rows, we've got density and then aragonite saturation state. Um, if you're not familiar with this, it's a measure of ocean acidification and sort of the textbook cutoff between saturated and unsaturated is value of one. So values above uh, one are good for shellfish, below are bad for shellfish, but it's much more nuanced than that. Um, and you can see that value, this is the saturation horizon uh, where it equals one, goes right up onto the continental shelf in the future. Similarly for the pH and for the oxygen, these units, um, for these units, about 60 is the hypoxic cutoff. And so um, you can see too the hypoxic waters making their way onto the shelf. So for a series of points along the continental uh, margin there, we found the aragonite saturation horizon would shoal by 100 meters and the oxygen minimum zone by 75 meters. When we're working on this, we understood that it's not just the mean that affects biology, but the extremes are really important, right? Um, so if you had a hypoxic event, that could kill a bunch of fish, even if it didn't last for very long. Uh, so we, we looked at outputting max and mins as well as our five-day averages. And what we found was that hypoxia, temperature, and acidification are projected to become more frequent and more extreme. And so we're using the, the hindcast to understand that. And I'm gonna show you just a little bit of our evaluation before I talk about some of the analysis we've been doing. The observational data that I've used is mostly from water properties. They have some nice net CDFs that make it really easy to use, but CDFs, uh, bottle data. I'm also gonna show you some mimic um, mixed layer depth comparisons, uh, I've got tide gauge data from CHS. The evaluation metrics I'm going to show are the root mean squared error, the R squared, which is a measure of the correlation, the revised Wilmot 2012 score, which uh, ranges from negative one to one and is a, a measure of the forecast error, the relative forecast error. I've got SMAPE, which is symmetric mean absolute percent error. Small values are good for this. It's uh, another sort of relative percent error kind of thing. And there's a nice Python toolbox that uh, can help you calculate all sorts of evaluation metrics. And so um, for temperature and salinity, I'm just starting here, um, dividing the region into uh, subregions. And so I've got the North Coast in green and the West Coast of Vancouver Island in pink. And here I'm showing, um, for all the plots, I'm showing the model on the y-axis, the temperature on the x-axis, and this is a 2D histogram. So it hides a few outliers, but it really shows you where most of the points are, are concentrated. So I've got the North Coast um, showing temperature and then salinity. And you can see my R squared values are pretty good. Similarly for uh, West Coast Vancouver Island, root mean squared errors are acceptable. My uh, percent errors are, are really low. And I've got a really good Wilmot score. So we're really quite happy with, with this. Um, so for the uh, mixed layer depths and tides, here I'm showing the comparison with MIMIC 
and I've colored uh, the scatter plot with the months of the year. We have a bit of a, a winter bias in our mixed layer depths, um, but overall we're doing pretty good for this uh, series of points that I've taken along the, the coast. For tide gauges, there's a lot of different things you can look at. Here I'm showing uh, root mean squared error for the total water level and uh, big thanks to Michael Denfi and his team who let me use their uh, evaluation tools to look at, at the tides. So what about the biogeochemistry? Well, um, model, the, the model evaluation for uh, nitrate oxygen BIC is shown here. In the orange um, text, I'm showing the North Coast and in blue, the West Coast Vancouver Island. Um, I am showing the uh, percent errors here and uh, the Wilmot scores. And they're pretty good with the exception maybe of DIC, which isn't quite as good. But it's, it's also important to note that we have way less samples to compare to for the DIC but our percent errors are all fairly acceptable. And so one thing that we noticed though is that our nitrate is a bit too high near the surface and our oxygen is a bit too low. But overall, we think that the model is doing a, a pretty good job of capturing the, uh, the, the real conditions of the region. And so we're gonna go on ahead and look at extremes. And so we decided to start with just looking at the benthic. And so I'm characterizing extremes using a relative threshold approach. And I've grabbed this paper, uh, figure from Gruber's 2021 paper where he nicely explains some of these methods. I've defined my extremes for each season using the fifth percentile of the distribution uh, of the entire uh, hind cast period. So basically you just plot these uh, distributions and then pick off the very edges as your extremes, either the fifth or 95th percentile. For my analysis of my three hourly outputs, I've actually removed all the narrow straits and channels, as you can see in purple here, because the resolution of the model um, isn't really adequate uh, for us to include those regions. Okay, so we wanted to use an objective method to define regions in, in the benthic. So we clustered by temperature, depth, aragonite saturation state, and the apparent oxygen utilization. If you're not familiar with the AOU, it's basically just you take your oxygen concentration and you sub subtract off the solubility component. Um, often it's used as a uh, proxy for biological activity. And so when you have larger values, that means um, it's uh, there's more biological activity, but tends to be deeper in the ocean. So uh, we found eight distinct clusters in the top 1,000 meters, and I'm going to show you three different examples. So first of all, we've got Queen Charlotte Sound shallows. And at the bottom, I'm showing the mean values of the cluster. We've got um, fairly saturated waters that are shallow with a really low AOU. And in the Queen Charlotte Sound canyons, I've got um, much lower values of aragonite saturation state, uh, deeper depths, much higher AOU. And then finally, I've got this, what we're calling the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but it really includes um, a lot more than, than just that. And here we've got a depth of about 114 meters. We've got uh, AOUs about 100. And so you could call this the oxygenated coastal shelf um, because, well, it's quite oxygenated, but we still have a lot of uh, biological activity there. So we take these different uh, regions. And here I'm just showing you the um, different probability density functions and for each of the variables. And so as we go across, we've got the temperature, oxygen, and aragonite saturation. And I want you to notice that the, the limits on these plots change, so they're not comparable in that way, but we want you to see the distributions. And of course, because we're defining our extremes by season and by region, what it means to be extreme is going to be different for the shallows than the canyons than um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And so in particular, I'll draw your attention to the temperature plots here. You can see that in the shallows, um, this in the summer, so summer is orange and uh, winter is blue. And in the summer, the, the temperatures are, are, are generally greater than in the winter for the shallows, but the opposite is true in the canyons. And this is because as Gucci was talking about, we're in this um, upwelling regime where we get uh, upwelling in the summer that brings really cold, nutrient rich, oxygen poor and acidic waters close to the surface. And in the winter, we have downwelling that brings the, the relatively warm, but oxygen rich uh, waters to depth. And so maybe a little bit counterintuitive in that sense. We have a lot more variability in the Strait of Juan de Fuca region. 
And um, if we look at the oxygen, we might think, you know, we get more hypoxic conditions in the canyons, but um, certainly a lot more variability in the other two regions. And I think a similar thing is true for the uh, aragonite saturation state. Okay, so I want to show you an example of um, single extremes in each region. So here I'm showing you Queen Charlotte Sound Canyons, and I'm applying temperature oxygen aragonite saturation state. And you're looking at the percentage of waters on the y-axis versus um, the years on the x-axis. Uh, if you're familiar with the sort of ENSO pattern, uh, this really shows up here, uh, especially, you know, you can pick out this 1997, 1998, um, there was a El Nino-La Nina uh, twist. And um, there's also sort of a signature of the marine heat wave that waves that have happened. And so we need to do some more work to try to connect these drivers. For oxygen, um, patterns aren't quite as clear, but we do think by separating them out into these objectively defined regions, it will help us to link them to the drivers a little bit more easily. Um, for aragonite saturation state, I think you can really pick up an increasing trend in this time series. Um, but again, it's all, all pretty hand wavy at this point. We wanted to look at contemporaneous extremes, but what we actually found was that for temperature, it didn't really occur together with the other extremes very often. Uh, and so here I'm just plotting the contemporaneous oxygen and omega A extremes for each of the regions. And for the Queen Charlotte Sound uh, shallows, what really stands out is that summertime, which is in orange, is really the, the time to be worried about uh, extreme conditions. Uh, again, my axis limits aren't, aren't the same as we go down. So we have less um, concomitant extremes in the, in the shallows and more in the, in the canyons and maybe a, more still in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The pattern, though, that we see in this top panel, um, there is sort of a regular pattern here. And so I wonder if we can tie this to some of the atmospheric drivers because it is so uh, shallow. As we look a bit, uh, look down here, um, you can notice maybe there is an increasing pattern here, but uh, we need to do a bit more work to understand it. But one thing I want you to notice is that uh, for all of them, these concomitant extremes are not uncommon. And so just to summarize the work that we've done so far, we found that it's really important to subdivide the region using an objective method. This way you don't have to rely on expert knowledge. Um, and um, we found that while there are many incidents of temperature extremes, they rarely occur at the same time as other stressors. And finally, contemporaneous oxygen and omega A extremes are not infrequent over 5% of the waters at some point in time. I also um, should mention too that the regions that we found from this analysis are actually similar to other sort of ecological mapping efforts um, that have been done. So that's sort of encouraging. And so I don't have any more time, but I'm just going to put this video on and maybe take a question. Um, so this is just showing the benthic oxygen, omega A, NO3, and temperature. It plays uh, pretty fast. Um, but if you if you watch for um, the extremes, you can see extreme oxygen coming into the canyons, extreme omega A in the canyons as well. And you can also pick up on the winter renewal um, that's coming from the south. The California undercurrent brings with it highly saturated, nutrient rich, and relatively warm waters. And you might think, oh, good, highly saturated waters that should help with acidification. But no, no, no. These waters cause a lot of biological productivity. And so, when we have a strong California undercurrent, we actually expect extremes to follow. And so I'll leave it there and thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Amber, for the great presentation. And uh, uh, I look at a schedule and we have, uh, according to the schedule, we have about five minutes for questions. And if you have a questions, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat. Uh, Gochi. Oh, hi, Amber, uh, for a very nice you know, presentation. And uh, I just wonder, you know, you also at the mentioned the impact of the California undercurrent. So do you actually note it? Do you have like a documented like examples how strengthening of the California undercurrent, you know, affecting actually and the oxygen and intrusion into those canyons? Or? Uh, I think that in Thompson, uh, the Thompson paper that you referenced, they do indicate that the uh, there's a 
a northern extent to the California current system. Um, but no, I don't have, I can't really point to anything beyond that. Um, but I, there's a lot of speculation in the literature about the effects. Um, and so, yeah, we're interested in actually, you know, making sure that we're capturing that well with this model and then trying to see if we can, you know, draw some correlation. Like, is there, do, can we see that we get an increased bloom after a strong Al a California undercurrent? And then, you know, what's the time to hypoxia uh, from the peak of the bloom or something like that to try to understand it a bit better. Okay, yeah, that's good. I think so. We have now good models. I think we can do more certainly in this direction. Right? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Next is uh, Laura. Talk. Um, I just was wondering if you were thinking, or it's part of the plans to instead of looking at summer versus winter, maybe look at upwelling versus downwelling season two, and th see how uh, the analysis. Yeah, how things change in, in that space of time. Yeah, so Thanks. you mean like actually calculating when the upwelling is happening and then uh, when it isn't? Yeah, I'm trying to, to, to look at the effects of extremes under, well, whether the, it's more common to have extremes under upwelling seasons versus downwelling seasons. It's just an idea that popped up in my mind. Not sure yeah. if it's totally off, uh, totally useful. Yeah, yeah. No, but that, that, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think because I think actually a point of the challenge of this project is just that there's so much data and so many things that you can look at. Um, and so I think our thinking was that we were kind of breaking it down into upwelling and downwelling seasons by looking at the winter and summer, but we could we could more closely look at when upwelling starts and when it when it finishes. Um, but then, yeah. Yeah, we could. Yes. No, it's, yeah. It, I, yeah. I just got me thinking that why, why is winter December, January, and February and not January, February, and March? And then March sometimes is upwelling, sometimes yeah, it's the transition. So it's kind of, yeah, interesting how, how the difference in timing could affect results or not. Thank you. Yeah, so actually like our first order uh, study is to, um, to kind of like use this. The idea is, you know, if we can define the extremes in this way, then for our climate simulations, we might actually be able to take a shortcut, right? So instead of outputting these really high frequency outputs, I could do something like output the number of extremes that occur per unit time or something like that. And so instead of having all of these outputs, um, we could we could do a shortcut. So we're thinking about that, just first characterizing when and where they happen. Um, but I think relating it to upwelling downwelling is really key because that seems to be a you know a a key driver. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's time to move on to our third speaker. And our third speaker is Natasha Ritner, and who is also from DFO. And uh, the presentation, we're going to focus on Salish Sea and look at uh, climate simulations. All right, you can see my, my screen? Yeah, looks good. All right, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Natasha and um, today I'll be talking about our project here uh, titled Future Climate Change Simulations for the Salish Sea using a high resolution ocean model with biogeochemistry. Uh, it is quite an, an involved project as you can see by the number of names on the slide. So I have a number of co-authors, Tim, Eva, Armand, Rachel, Susan, Roland, Michael, and Amber as well as a number of contributors listed below. And um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish and Wasainich people. So our study area is the Salish Sea. It is uh, located in southwestern BC, or known as the tropical part of Canada. Um, the Salish Sea is shared by Canada, the US, and the Coast Salish people. It is an urban sea, meaning that it is surrounded and influenced by large metropolitan areas such as uh, Vancouver, Seattle, and Victoria. And there are a number of users of the sea. So um, there's roughly 9 million people that live along uh, the coast. Uh, so of course, they, they use the sea not only for recreational activities, but for whatever else the, the locals do. Um, 
uh, but is also used for economic activities as well, such as uh, fisheries, aquaculture, so growing shellfish, uh, shipping and tourism. Uh, of course, this Coast Salish people not only use the sea uh, as a source of food, but the species uh, in the sea as well as the sea itself is tightly linked to their culture and identity. And then finally, and certainly not least, is the ecosystem. So this ranges from the diatoms to the salmon to the southern resident orcas. And uh, it's not only the, the sea creatures, but it's also all the land dwelling animals as well that do rely on the Salish Sea for its services uh, too. Uh, but currently the Salish Sea is starting to show uh, evidence of ocean acidification, warmer temperatures and low oxygen or, or hypoxia. <clears throat> and so here is just a figure from a paper published last year uh, showing some of the impacts that <clears throat> Uh, that ocean acidification has had on some of these shelled organisms. And we see various levels of damage uh, on the shell because uh, of course uh, acidic water does dissolve these shells and make it really difficult for them to form their shells. So there's actually quite a lot of damage in this particular one. Um, and so we want to know how um, the sea and these three uh, ecosystem stressors will change in the future. And, and this is important um, because essentially we want to identify vulnerable regions um, that will be more susceptible to these three stressors um, that may be more harmed by um, ocean acidification or low oxygen, kind of as Amber mentioned uh, before. And these regions, these vulnerable regions may overlap with culturally significant areas or areas where economic activities take place. <laughs> Um, and so hopefully the results of this study will help to assist in future planning and also help to mitigate some of the negative impacts that um, these three stressors uh, can cause. Uh, so since we want to look at changes in the future, uh, we're going to use some climate projections. And so the, the modeling aspect to hopefully achieve our goal at the end um, is to develop high resolution climate simulations for the Salish Sea with biogeochemistry for the years 1986 to 2005 for our historical period. And then we're going to have two future scenarios uh, for 1946 to 2065 for a moderate mitigation uh, RCP of 4.5 and a no mitigation scenario. And that would be an RCP of 8.5. Uh, so we will be using uh, Sailor Seacast from Susan Allen's group at UBC. Uh, the model domain is shown here along with the model bathymetry. Uh, it uses NEMO 3.6 and includes tides and biogeochemistry, chemistry, uh, specifically uh, smelt and scog. Uh, but we are missing high resolution atmospheric forcing for our climate simulations. And we also wanted to add an improvement to the biogeochemistry module, um, and that would be adding a sediment component um, at the very bottom at the sediment water interface. So one of the issues is that many climate model projections are too coarse to show the level of detail we need for future planning. So as an example, we have the Salish Seacast uh, landmass shown here in black and a climate model atmospheric grid uh, overlain in gray. Um, and we see if we just use the, in quotation, the raw climate model uh, atmospheric data, we might have two atmospheric grid points that could provide data to Sailor Seacast, um, but this would not provide us with the level of detail that we would need for a realistic atmospheric forcing to force the ocean model. So how can we go from a coarse resolution climate model to get fine resolution atmospheric forcing. So there are two methods that we can use. Uh, the first is statistical downscaling, and this work has been done by Armand and Susan at UBC. Uh, and basically what it is, we have, we take a coarse uh, or coarser resolution regional climate model and a fine resolution uh, atmospheric product, in this case, HRDPS. And we can use statistics to find a st statistical relationship between the two. Um, and then we can use this statistical relationship to get atmospheric forcing for other years. It is quite fast to run and to set up. 
Um, it does need overlapping time periods between the fine and coarse model output, and it also needs temporal representation of storms in the climate model. The second method is called dynamical downscaling, and this work has been done by Eva, Tim, Roland, and Rachel, also at UBC. And uh, this involves a series of nests. So it, for example, if you're a Nemo ocean modeler, it's a bunch of egg rifts. Um, so we're using the weather research forecast model or WARF. Um, and basically we're going from our very coarse resolution uh, climate model atmosphere at about 300 kilometers uh, through uh, three nests in, shown in these colors. Here's the boxes, uh, each providing um, boundary conditions for this smaller nest. Um, and we end up with something like this, where we can go from our Canadian Earth System model uh, grid here to a high resolution product where we actually see uh, the impacts of topography on the temperature in this particular case. And so we have done a test run uh, running Sailor Seacast with the wharf uh, output and everything looks good. Uh, so we're just uh, running a couple more tests with WARF and doing some evaluation before um, it'll be mostly Eva who's running the historical um, uh, portion for, for WARF. And our other, um, so our, our addition to the biogeochemistry module will be a sediment model. Um, and so currently in um, the biogeochemistry model, um, sinking particles such as detritus or uh, biogenic uh, silica uh, are reflected at, a, at the bottom uh, at a reduced fraction. So burial is um, somewhat included. Uh, but what we wanted to include was uh, more temporal and spatial variability. So we will add a timeline between these sinking fluxes and then what's coming out of the sediment. Um, and we will also modify some of the fluxes to uh, hopefully have some more spatial variability and to remove any kind of constant uh, fluxes. Uh, and so we will do this for the silicon and nitrogen cycles, um, which will then also impact uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, as well as oxygen, which do link back to the ecological stressors I mentioned at the beginning. And so for testing the sediment model, uh, James Monroe has done a lot of work uh, setting up a 1D column model for us to test uh, the sediment model on. Uh, and so what I'm showing here uh, is basically the 1D model shown in orange and the 3D model that provides boundary conditions to the 1D model in blue. And we have the two velocity components, the temperature and salinity, as well as silicon and diatoms. Um, and so hopefully this works. Uh, so we see that uh, for the two velocity components, as well as temperature and salinity, the uh, 1D model is able to restore back to the 3D model, uh, but we have the silicon and the diatoms able to evolve freely. So this will allow us to test um, our setup and various tuning um, without being uh, having to worry about it restoring back to the 3D model. All right, so I'm a little faster than I thought. Um, so uh, to summarize what I have talked about, so the Salish Sea is showing evidence of anthropogenic change. And so we are currently developing a fine resolution model simulation for the historical and future periods. So we can get an idea of uh, vulnerable areas in uh, the Salish Sea um, that will ho hopefully help for planning as well as mitigation in the future. So a lot of technical work has happened up to this point uh, and it will continue for the next little bit. Um, but next steps are getting boundary conditions that include biogeochemistry, um, getting historical and future river discharge. Uh, we're currently in the middle of evaluating wharf and now that we have a, a working 1D model, um, we can start playing around with this sediment model. Uh, so since I'm fast, I have a, a short video just showing uh, bottom level variables for 2016 to 2017 for Sailor's Seacast. Um, and so here I'm showing temperature nitrate concentration 
dissolved oxygen concentration and aragonite saturation. Um, so as Amber had mentioned earlier, uh, she used a similar color bar. Uh, red values here denote uh, low oxygen, um, which makes it very difficult for uh, certain species to survive. And then also for aragonite saturation, which can be associated with ocean uh, acidity, uh, values of one and less. Uh, so the yellow and the green um, show more acidic waters. Uh, so I'll just let this, this play and you guys can see what's happening. Um, we do see that the boundaries do have a large influence on, of course, what's coming in. So these are related to the boundary conditions, the, the low oxygen and the acidic waters coming in. Um, but it's just something interesting, sort of links back to what Amber was talking about earlier with um, the low oxygen and acidic waters um, going up onto the shelf. So yeah, I'll, I'll just let this play to the end, but uh, thank you all for listening and I can take any questions. Thank you very much, Natasha. And we have about uh, three minutes for questions. Again, if you have a questions and please raise your hand or type them in the chat. Again, go to Okay, yes. Uh... Yeah, great talk, Natasha. I think it's going to be a great project. And uh, so you have considering, you know, uh, you are considering to, you know, atmospheric downscaling, and that's great, you know, so high resolution. What about um, for the ocean boundary condition and the, the hydrological, uh, like a river runoff? And do you, know, you know, plan to do some downscaling maybe for the, you're using wolf model output for, for river runoff. And uh, do you think also the uh, open boundary condition from ocean uh, of the global model or the ocean global model would be enough you know, for, for the open boundary at this wonderful street you know, entrance? Yeah, yeah so, so one of the ideas for boundary conditions was actually using Amber Snap 36 uh, because she has climate scenarios um, that cover the same time period and the same, um, the same scenarios as well. So that is one idea uh, for the historical. We were going to compare a couple different products as well, uh, but we were a little concerned. And this was came up like yesterday, so we still have some some searching to do. But to make sure that the climate, the different variations in climate all line up, that we don't have an offset in certain signals. Um, and then for the river discharge, we we uh, do have daily. Uh, discharge for the Fraser um, from a number of uh, climate models. Uh, so we were also going to do sensitivity experiments uh, using the highest uh, amount of runoff and the lowest and then something in the middle. Uh, and so it does look actually like the, the Canadian Earth System model, both the 4.5 and the 8.5 have the highest amount of Fraser discharge um, of the, the model. I think it was the CMEP model runs that we were looking at. Um, I have to check. Uh, so we do have that, but there does need to be some modification and checking. So that's kind of the next next step for for that. So I hope I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, good. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, we got a question from chat, and uh, Delay, do you want to uh, ask uh, the question? Sure. Uh, yeah. It's a, a quick question because uh, you, you tried two different way of downscaling the atmospheric forcing. And I wonder if you compare them uh, with the uh, overlapped period, like the WOLF and the HRDPS. And what's the result? Yes, yes. Um, so not yet. This is also work that I have not specifically done. Um, other uh, students uh, have been doing it. Um, I think uh, we are rerunning, uh, or not myself, Eva is rerunning uh, some years for the wharf uh, downscaling. And I think um, 
for the statistical downscaling, uh, it has not quite been finished uh, yet. Uh, there was a co-op student, Armand, who was working on it, um, and he finished his co-op. So I think Susan, who is very, very busy, I think she was going to take it up. Um, so, but no, we haven't compared the two methods just yet, uh, but I think that will come soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And thank you. Now our last uh Two talks, we're going to shift our region of interest to Northern Canada. And uh, the first one is given by Christopher Peck from the University of Manitoba. And he's going to talk about the river plume dynamics. Christopher, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, I'm going to have to keep my camera off because I'm currently in the UK, so I just want to make sure that the internet is as good as it can be. Uh, you can share your screen now. Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, so my talk is going to be on the southern expansion of the Lagrange River Plume although this is not technically correct, um, as I'll get into later on. So when the mouth of a river uh, meets the coast, it releases lower density fresh water into a higher saline ambient ocean water, and this is known as a river plume. A river plume is then a source of both buoyancy and momentum. The fate of a river plume is influenced by external forcing, such as discharge, tidal forcing, the ambient coastal circulation, wind forcing, and ice conditions. Wind forcing can be split into both upwelling and downwelling conditions. Upwelling conditions move the surface waters away from the coast, and with it goes the plume. So in this diagram here, you can see the plume is exposed to wind over sea hours, and as the wind exposure increases, the plume gets further and further away from the coast. The opposite is true for downwelling, where the plume is then pinned up against the coast and sometimes forced downwards, sometimes connecting with the bottom. Crush or wind conditions produce similar results with winds towards the coast, pinning the plume on the coast and winds away from the coast, moving it away. It is thought, however, that wind forcing plays little to no role on ice plumes. However, we may have discovered that this may not be the case. Under ice river plumes often have a much larger extent than those in open water conditions. The Lagrand River complex is one such river plume where it is covered by landfast ice edge for over six months of the year. The Lagrand River complex is located in the southern Hudson Bay known as James Bay on the northeast coast. And it is a regulated river uh, which terminates near the Chisassabi, local community of Chisassabi. Because it is regulated, the peaks are during the winter, whereas a normal river would peak during the spring freshets in June and July. It peaks during the winter as people need lots of energy to heat their homes, and the discharge is increased over tenfold. The Coriolis force and background circulation turn the plume to the right, to the north, into James Bay, and then into the rest of Hudson Bay, taking it past many coastal inlets where eelgrass can be found, Eelgrass is a very culturally important plant to the town of Chisassabi. They hunt these which eat the eelgrass, and it's been a very big part of their culture. So the Grand River Plume was characterized by Peck et al. in 2022, and we found that comparing to other years, it didn't expand to the north significantly. So this graph here shows distance from the river mouth to the south, and the red lines in 2016 and 2017 show that the salinity, the surface salinity didn't expand that much further than it did in 1987 and 1984. This was because of local topography about 40 kilometers away and the landfast ice edge being very much constrained to this topography, not allowing the center of the plume to expand any further northwards. We did, however, find that the plume was expanding further to the south, to the the diagram. You can see the blue and red lines for 2016 and 2017, showing a much lower salinity than that in 1987 and even 1984. 
So to investigate this southward movement of the plume, uh, we placed four moorings in different coastal inlets. Each coastal inlet uh, experiences different degrees of plume exposure. So as you can see, the one closest to the mouth in CH3-8 uh, has a very fresh water column all the way down to the bottom. Then moving further south, you've got CH33-2, where you've got higher salinity at the bottom and some stratification. Then all the way at CH37-1, it's very high salinity with a very strong stratification occurring. An example of the mooring can be seen here, where you've got a very simple structure of metal poles put together with a weight at the bottom, instruments attached to the metal pole, and a buoy so that divers can recover them in the summer. These moorings were placed in the water column for a full year, so being deployed in the summer of August 2019 and recovered by local community members in the summer of 2020. I then laid over the top of the landfast ice, uh, the typical extent of the Lagrange River plume, showing that it expands. Uh, this is based on CTD data of 2019, showing that it expands 30 kilometers to the north and south with a salinity of zero to five, and then increasing as you get further away. Now this expansion is unusual because of the background circulation going to the north, but it has been modeled before that with continuing discharge and land fast ice, that plumes can expand much further than the mouth to the north and to the south, regardless of the background circulation. So these were the results from the moorings. I'll first talk about temperature, which shows a very typical profile, with it being decreasing as you get into the winter months and being in and around freezing. And then it's very stable during the winter months before increasing in the summer as the ice begins to melt. And then during the summer when there's no ice, you've got lots of daily variation with the sun coming in and out. Interestingly, the moorings closest to the rhythm mass, so CH3-8 and CH33-2, had a higher temperature than those further away in CH37, indicating that the Lagrande is influencing these areas throughout the winter. The salinity also shows a very typical uh, salinity profile for these areas. So the, the moorings closest to the rhythm mass, CH3, Dash eight and CH thirty three dash two had the lowest salinity and the most daily variation, as the plume is set outside of these coastal inlets and is then pushed by the tide in and out, uh, causing some horizontal stratification as well as vertical. Then, as you get further away, the salinity is higher and much more stable throughout. However, all moorings did show a salinity decrease for a twenty day period in the middle of February. Now CH3-8 did decrease a bit earlier in January, but then remained at that level for over 90 days. CH3-2 decreased first with a rapid increase, decrease from 16 to about three salinity. And then CH34 went and then CH37 also decreasing by about 10, 10 salinity units. So to understand why all these moorings were affected along the coast, um, despite being some 90 kilometers away from the Lagrange River mouth, we had to look at the external factors that can affect river plumes. So I first started with the discharge. So this is a seven day average of the Lagrande River plume and all of the rivers south of the Lagrande combined. So all of the rivers south of the Lagrande are not regulated and show a very normal profile with the discharge being highest in the spring freshet and very low during the winter. And during that 20 day period in February, it was around 1000 cubic meters per second. The Lagrande, however, has the highest discharge along the entire coast. And during the winter, it has an average of about 5000 cubic meters per second. And then tapering off as energy requirements get lower. This shows that the redu reduction of salinity in these coastal inlets is not from other sources south of the Lagrande, since there's simply not enough fresh water to travel to the north. I then looked at the wind and the corresponding water depth. So I plotted the east-west component in the blue line 
and the north south component in the orange dash line. And the wind is pretty typical, it changes regularly and is never gets that strong. And interestingly, during this 20 day period highlighted in green, which is the same period as the low salinity, although the wind is never that strong, there is a sustained period of westerly wind. And that's the wind blowing towards the shore. And the water depth initially does increase, but then tapers off again, implying that when this sustained wind period first occurs, the water is pushed up against the shore and increases water depth. Next, I looked at the currents, which we also had on these models. Shows a very typical profile with the currents being very much subdued during the ice cover period and much more active in the ice free period. Interestingly, during this same 20 day period, the currents towards the west, which in this case is away from the coast, increase, implying that there's some sort of induced currents going on, the wind forcing mentioned earlier. So how might the plume on this? Well, before the 20 day period in the 13th of January, you've got very mobile pack ice, you've got some, a little lead uh, between the landfast ice edge and a typical plume extend characterized in 2019 with the center of the plume expanding 30 kilometers north and south of the mouth. Then during the sustained wind period, the mobile pack ice is pushed up against the shore, pushed up against the landfast ice edge, and with it goes the plume. So through the transfer of motion of the mobile pack ice, the waters then transfer underneath the landfast ice edge and push the plume up against the shore, similar to downwelling conditions, and pins it there. Then after the 20 day period has subsided, the mobile pack ice moves back out into the bay and normal plume conditions will resume. Now this is how the plume will look at the surface, but how might the plume look uh, underneath? Because these moorings are at depths of three to four meters and they're still experiencing decreases in salinity. So under normal conditions with no wind, you've got mobile pack ice next to the landfast ice edge, and the plume is sitting just offshore of these coastal inlets, unaffected, the moorings are then unaffected by the plume. The background circulation takes the, takes the plume to the north. Then as the wind forcing comes on and the mobile pack ice is pushed up against the landfast ice edge, it then pushes the water, the plume into these coastal inlets and downwards. So similar to downwelling conditions, the plume then expands uh, through the water column and can sometimes connect to the bottom. So you may be thinking, after the, land, the mobile pack ice is pushed up against the landfast ice edge, how is the plume then sustained in these coastal inlets when there's no more transfer of motion and the mobile pack ice is firmly pinned up against the landfast ice edge? Well. As mentioned earlier, currents were induced by the brought in more fresh water into these areas, circulating around in the inlets, continually bringing in fresh water. There's also buoyancy to consider. So the buoyancy forcing wants to expand outwards continuously. And as you bring in more fresh water into the area, it's going to want to continue to expand and keep the fresh water in these coastal inlets. So to summarize, river plume dynamics are controlled by various factors and the reverse expansion of the plume is not unusual as it is under ice and has been modeled before to expand several north and south of the mouth. The enlarged river plume of the Lagrand is impacted by strong wind events through the transfer of motion of mobile pack ice. These wind events create similar conditions to that of downwelling, whereby the plume is pinned up against the coast and forced downwards. The pinned plume is then sustained by resulting conditions such as induced currents and buoyancy forcing. Thank you very much for listening. And are there any questions? I see you popped up because my time might be running out. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. And uh, uh, we probably have a uh, time for one quick question. 
Uh, I have a, I saw Fred Dupont have a, a question in the chat. Do you want to ask your question? Hi, Xiang. Uh, thanks, Christopher. The, uh, uh, maybe um, I missed that detail at the beginning, but uh, the, the top of the mooring must be uh, um, low enough that it doesn't hit the, the ice, right? Yes. So um, we looked for areas that were between three to four meters, hoping for four meters, but the, sometimes you don't get that um, because the ice is only about a meter thick in these locations. And the tide only also goes down, up and down a meter. So if we have four meters, we've got about two meters to play with. So it doesn't get frozen and doesn't get moved. Uh, they were all in the exact same location. So thankfully it worked out and none of them were picked up. Okay, there's no, because it's mostly then fast ice, there's no uh, ice rigid in uh, forming in that location? Yes, they're all very, very coastal. So there's no ridges forming there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, it's no time to move on. Our uh, last speaker, our last speaker okay. is Alexia Kuzi, and uh, she's going to also talk about the La Grande River plume and focus on nutrient distribution. All right, let me just... All right, thank you so much for uh, the introduction. Um, and yes, my area, um, my topic uh, today will be in the same area as uh, Chris's. Um, so it's great that you have some <laughs> added context here. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about the influence of seasonal freshwater dynamics on nutrient distributions in the region of freshwater influence of the La Grande River in Northeastern James Bay. Um, and this is part of my uh, master's thesis at the University of Manitoba. All right, so um, I'll just go over a little bit of, um, give you a little bit of context and um, then I'm gonna go through my study area and results discussion and conclusions, pretty simple outline here. Um, so the region that we're looking at is Northeastern James Bay, um, which is home to the Cree Nation of Chisassabi, um, specifically is what we're looking at in this, um, in this presentation anyways. There's a few other Cree Nations that live along the coast as well. And um, essentially the reasons why, um, or the motivation for this project were because um, essentially there have been environmental changes observed over the last several decades um, associated with things like climate change and hydroelectric development. Um, as Chris had mentioned in the previous presentation, this area has been subject to hydroelectric development um, since the 1970s and um, impacted the Le Grand River by making it one of the largest discharging rivers to Hudson Bay. Um, as of late. This coastal area specifically is very widely used by community members and it contains many important habitats, especially eelgrass. Um, and the reason why um, kind of this project started um, was concern over the changes that were being observed in the health and the extent of eelgrass beds. Um, as you can see here, this is a, just an image in the top right of what healthy eelgrass beds look like and um, it's essentially uh, an aquatic rooted grass. And what we have um, also is there's been very limited <clears throat> biogeochemical data that was collected here, um, especially in the winter time, just because it's very difficult to access these areas in the winter. Um, so in light of these gaps and these concerns, um, my research objective is to assess the relationships between freshwater from different sources and nutrient distributions, um, looking at both ice covered and ice free seasons in, in this area. Okay. All right, so this, I just wanna um, also mention that this is a uh, very heavily um, involved with the community, um, very uh, much so a community collaboration. We worked um, alongside land users 
and community members um, from the Cree Nation of Chisassibi. And the town itself is located on the coast of the La Grande River right over here. And LGR is uh, denoting the La Grande River. And um, they were the ones that took us out to do all the sampling. Um, and this was done in 2016 and 2017. And um, on these maps, you can see these were winter stations that were visited. And this is the summer stations that were visited. And um, I will describe in, the, in my results section, you'll see early winter, late winter, and summer periods. Um, there were three separate um, sampling campaigns done. Early winter refers to January, um, late winter refers to April, and summer refers to um, August. And at, I, at each of these stations, um, CTD profiles were taken as well as bulk water samples. Um, I'll be talking about the bulk water sample results today. And from those, we analyzed for salinity, oxygen isotope ratio tracer data, um, which I will be referring to as DELO18, just because it's easier to <laughs> talk about, and also macronutrients, specifically um, nitrate and phosphate. And again, here's just a quick figure here for context of how many rivers are um, discharging into James Bay, um, but the Lagrande is located around here and it's um, one of the largest. And this is just the general flow direction. So um, typically, when rivers discharge into the bay, it would turn in this direction. So um, because of the development and diversion um, of the rivers in this area, and uh, Chris talks way more about this, but um, just from our bottle data, um, we um, you can see here that the plume, which is the low salinity, so the purple points here, is much larger in the winter time. Um, so early winter, late winter, expands a little further south. And then in summer, it's much smaller of a, an influential area of the river. And the Lagrange is located right over here. Um, and essentially, this is due to this change in spatial extent of the low salinity area or the plume is due both to the difference in discharge rates throughout the seasons and as well as the land fast ice. Um, with the land fast ice, it restricts the wind driven um, surface mixing um, that we would see that we see in summertime. So Here's a figure just showing the general water column results that we got um, and, it look, and what it looks like in terms of the salinity, the oxygen isotope tracer, so DELO18 and nitrate and phosphate within the three seasons. And this area is actually is quite shallow. Um, so as you gathered maybe from the last presentation, but our sampling stations were done um, at a maximum depth of 25 meters. And so just to walk you through this, in early winter, we see what we expect, a uh, very stratified water column where we have low salinity in the top five-ish meters, and it increases as we get deeper. That is reflected in the del 18, and we also see stratification happening um, or stratification patterns happening within the nutrients as well. In late winter, we see the same thing, a little bit stronger stratification. It kind of goes a little bit deeper here, so about to seven meters. We see about um, zero to five in salinity. And then in summer, we see um, the evidence of the mixing of the surface layer. We have a much larger range of salinity and del 18 up in the surface. And we also have evidence of drawdown of nutrients. So there's a breakdown of that stratification happening. Um, nitrate is close to zero, even in 15 meter waters. And our phosphate isn't as drawn down, but it's still very scattered. So to assess the water types that we're dealing with, in this area, we can actually look at the relationship between salinity and del 18. So by plotting these pairs, we can see that there are two end members or main water types. 
um, which are connected by the solid lines here. And I'll go into why we have two separate lines in a second. Um, so we essentially have this end, which is high salinity and high del 18 values, which represents our deep waters or James Bay seawater and our low salinity, low del 18 values or um, low negative uh, values that are um, representative of the Le Grand River waters. And so essentially what I did was I calculate, um, or I guess the first point would be, um, typically when we see kind of this noise in this relationship, it would sometimes indicate a third water type. Um, so something that could potentially be um, driving the freshening. Um, so in order to kind of figure that out, um, and I guess I should mention these squares and circles represent the winter, triangles represent the summer. So essentially we're seeing this noise and kind of a separate between summer and winter. Um, and in this area, potentially could be sea ice melt, which is the third water type here. Um, but in order to kind of establish that, I can calculate the fractions using appropriate end members and a set of linear equations. And calculating that out, um, we essentially establish that sea ice melt here is negligible. Um, and thus we only progress using uh, the two main water types here that are influencing this system. Now, why do we have um, this very seasonal difference then? If sea ice melt is not a contributing factor here, um, what we look at is how this is shifting. So in, in terms of the Le Grand River water, we have a shift in the del 18 value um, between winter and summer. And this has been observed in other high latitude rivers before. So that's not um, something that was very uh, unusual. And the, in terms of the James Bay seawater, however, um, what is unusual is that we observe a freshening of this, uh, the deep water source. So the, in winter, we have a much saltier water mass than in summer, which has freshened. And um, yeah, so having identified that, um, we suspect that the overall water mass has just freshened as it circulates throughout the bay. Um, but in saying that, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we need to, in further calculations around water types and that kind of thing, um, we need to have two separate um, values for each of the seasons. All right, so now let's look at um, the nutrient side of things. So here's a nitrate. Uh, Alika, you have two minutes left. Oh, okay. So um, essentially what we're observing here, now that we can establish that um, that um, the low salinity waters have high, um, we can say that the low salinity waters have high nitrate and low phosphate, which are equivalent to the Lagrand waters. And the high, our high salinity samples have lower nitrate and highest phosphate in winter. Um, in summertime, this is pretty much the same. It kind of just, moves downward a bit. And in summertime, we see this very, um, this drawdown of all the nutrients. And pretty much um, all of them are nitrate limited. And anything to the right of this line is essentially nitrate limited. So nitrate is being used up um, quicker than phosphate in the typical um, phytoplankton nutrient consumption ratio. Um, So essentially, I'm just going to quickly get through this. I had a little bit more time. Um, so in conclusion, essentially what we found, because we have um, 
So we, were, we ultimately provide the first tracer data set um, that's able to identify freshwater sources in this area, which is really critical uh, base um, to do future studies on this. And the, we can say that the Le Grand Plume is the dominant source of freshening along this coast and is associated with high nitrate that's coming into the system. Um, and it also influences the nutrient conditions within its seasonal variable um, extent. Um, and lastly, because the Lagrand hydrograph has changed where we have high flows in the winter and low flows in the summer, um, which is the opposite of what we would ex typically normally expect, um, the timing and the amount of nutrient supply has shifted between pre and post development. And this has implication for nutrient ratios and overall primary production that's occurring in these coastal areas. So essentially we're getting pulses and high amounts of nitrate in the winter time under ice when there's not a lot of primary production happening. And um, that timing has shifted now between what, would, what, what it would have been in the spring versus what it is now in the winter. So um, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll end there. Um, and I guess I don't have any time, so. Thank you very, very much, Alexia. Yeah. Um, there's a, actually a question from the chat and maybe you can answer it in the chat. And that is over last speaker and conclude our uh, third session uh, about coastal technology and uh, inland waters. And again, I want to thank all the speakers today. And uh, uh, we have uh, great discussions and uh, great presentations. Uh, I saw Jingyu and Guo Qi uh, still with us, and uh, I'm wondering, well, I'm going to turn over to them and for concluding remarks. So, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers and uh, for their wonderful presentations. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, the presentation to be given next uh, six months meeting uh, to be held in St. John's in Newfoundland. Uh, sure. Guo Qi, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just want to thank you very much for all the work you have done. You know, you yes. have organized this session. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Thank I saw things that everybody did a wonderful job. And I want to thank everybody. Yeah, so uh, quite a late. And uh, so uh, I want to thank everybody and uh, see you next time. Okay, okay. thank you, everyone. Bye bye. See you yeah. next year. Yeah, good. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Bye.